Hey guys, I just want to thank this uh, person who commented, and he said it seems, it still seems to me that Jesus was punished in our place based on verses like this, and he lists a few verses, Hebrews 9, 28, 1 Peter 2, 24, 1 Peter 3, 18, and I really appreciate this because this is what I want more verses to look at, and I was actually looking at a John MacArthur study on the penal substitutionary atonement that uh, I'll look at more as the days go on and the verses that he uses and the arguments he uses and maybe even print that study out and make notes on it but anyways um, I've seen some of the same some of these same verses here and I've already made a video on 1st Peter 2 24 and made some uh, points about it but I know I need to go over each of these more and more and um, I think that so let's look at Hebrews 9.28. It says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And I think, you know, the problem with all kinds of, you know, systematic uh, doctrines or, you know, systematic theology, um, you know, we're... we're raised up in the faith to believe these particular doctrines and those who believe particular doctrines have been taught that when we look at the scriptures we're looking at it through you know these lenses to where when we interpret these verses we can't see it any other way and um so i think that's an issue that you know it's hard to work around and So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And this is kind of the same language that's used in a lot of verses, but it's used in 1 Peter 2, 24, the next verse there. It says that he bore our sins. So in Hebrews 9, 28, it talks about bearing the sins of many. In 1 Peter 2, 24, it talks about him bearing or he bare our sins. Um... And in First Hebrews 2.24, I think I read from Albert Barnes' uh, commentary, and he said that it means that, you know, basically that Christ was a sin offering. And it doesn't mean that he actually uh, had our sins imputed to him, which is the belief, you know, I think the main belief of the penal substitutionary atonement. So a lot of times when people see this, uh, Christ bearing our sins, they have this idea, that we've been taught, that it means that our sins were imputed to him, you know, which basically makes him a sinner. And and then, because he bore our sins, he took our punishment, and so he suffered the wrath of God. And this pits the Father against the Son. And I've read, you know, I've read a lot of different articles uh, over the past few nights uh, of different views and refuting the penal substitutionary atonement and their arguments against it and so forth. And I've seen some people even mention how the penal substitutionary atonement is very likened to the pagans, how they sacrifice their children to Molech to, you know, to appease his wrath or so. And um, so, so believing the penal substitutionary atonement is kind of like, you know, the son was sacrificed to the Father uh, to appease his wrath. It's very similar to, to the sacrifices to Moloch. And, you know, let's look at 1 Peter 3.18 too. It says, for Christ, has, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so there's the suffering of Christ on the cross, and the penal substitutionary atonement basically attributes that suffering, um, the source of it, to the Father. Okay, Because the Father is punishing the Son. The Father is pouring out his wrath on the Son. And I think that we can clearly see that the punishment is not coming from the Father. You don't see that in Scripture, except for a couple verses in Isaiah, the suffering servant, which I've already covered over those, you know, where it says the, the, that God was pleased to bruise him and so forth and so on, and, and that doesn't mean 
that uh, God directly did that. Um, but that's how the penal substitutionary atonement people are going to believe it, regardless, because that's what they've been taught, and so it's hard to get out of that box. But that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to see, you know, how else can these verses be interpreted? What makes more sense, biblically, logically, all this? Um, you know, Christ did suffer for our sins. Again, that doesn't mean that our sins were imputed to him and then he was punished for our sins, you know. You know, the Bible talks about not punishing, you know, um, you know, not punishing the innocent, you know, putting putting guilt on the innocent. Uh, Jesus was perfectly innocent, perfectly without sin, always. And uh, I think to think any other way is blasphemy. But Christ did suffer for our sins, and he did suffer, absolutely, and he was put to death. But by who? You know, it was by sinners that punished him. Um... So he died for sinners, and, and he was he was punished from sinners, not from God. Um, and you know, I think there's the whole idea about you know the, the it's all it's all about the death of Jesus, and it, and it makes me wonder, you know, what is it about his death? Um, I think a lot of it, the gospel and, and the purpose of Jesus and everything, has to do with his life, you know, really and. And his death is part of his life. And his death is, you know, the end of his life. And his death, his suffering and his punishment, or his suffering to his death, is part of the obedience in his life, that he was obedient to the point of suffering and death. And, you know... Um, you know, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And, uh, let's see. Yeah. Or he gave his only begotten son. Okay. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so, I mean, I think there's a lot in just the life of Jesus, the fact that God became man or took on humanity for us. This is something that, uh, you know, God did out of love. You know, we have a sin problem. And so God the Son took on humanity to, uh, to restore us to God. And... And so, you know, there's the idea that of, of Jesus bearing sins in these verses. And I said that Albert Barnes kind of points it out as, as it means that he was a sin offering for us. And then there's the ideas of what was the purpose of the sin offering in the Old Testament. Was it to appease the wrath of God? You know, um, was it, you know... And I, I don't know all about the sin offering right now without looking into it further. You know, I haven't studied that a whole lot myself, but I know that there was, you know, lambs without spot, without blemish that were that were offered, you know, like a perfect lamb, basically, uh, you know, pure. And, you know, does it mean that the, the person's sins were imputed into the lamb? To, to appease God's wrath, and then the lamb suffered the punishment for the sins. Or, you know, was it... It was something else, that, that this offering was to be pleasing to God. Uh, to, to restore, to offer something that's pure in place of, you know, what isn't. So, you know, that might not be sound like I'm making a lot of sense. I'm just trying to think this out because there's a lot in, to, involved in it. But I do want to look at this before I end this, is that I know there's different sections of these verses that need to kind of be looked at um, and straightened out. And, 
you know, like there's the ver the parts of the verse where he, where it says he bare our, he bore our sins, and so some might think that that means that our sins were actually literally imputed to Christ. There's also you know the just for the unjust, you know, because there is a, you know a sense in which he is our substitution. And he took our place. It's just I just don't think that it's the, in the penal substitutionary sense. Um, and also that he suffered for sins. You know what's that mean? Um, but I also think uh, in Hebrews nine twenty eight where it says that he was once offered to, to bear the, bear the sins of many. And unto them that looked for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So I think that second time without sin unto salvation, I think that needs to be understood too. And so I've already got this. With Hebrews 9.28, Albert Barnes here. And I also want to say Albert Barnes and probably most of these people in Study Light or a lot of these commentaries are probably Calvinists for one, which I don't agree with them on their Calvinist views. And so... Therefore, probably most of them or all of them believe in the penal substitutionary atonement. So I can't always just go to these commentaries for, for you know, a good answer on, on this. Um, I think that some of the things that Albert Barnes said are good, and I agree with, but then in some areas he seems to kind of contradict himself, and um, so I have to look, you know, far and wide on the internet and, and through all my resources to uh, look at other interpretations, you know, I have to think about this. But it says, he shall appear the second time without sin, here is without sin. That is, when he comes again, he will not make himself a sin offering, or will not come in order to make atonement for sin. It is not that when he came the first time that he was in any sense a sinner, but that he came then with reference to sin. Or that the main object of his incarnation was to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When he comes the second time, it will be with reference to another object, and then it goes on to unto salvation. That is, to receive his friends and followers to eternal salvation. He will come to save them from all their sins and temptations. And so, basically... When it says it'll come the second time without sin, it means that he's not coming in reference to be a sin offering this time as he was during the incarnation. But this time to lead his followers into eternal salvation. So I think that's helpful to understand that part of this verse. Hebrews 9.28 And uh, So that's that, and I looked them up more on the satisfaction theory of atonement, and I said that it, Catholics pretty much believe that. Um, I came across something the other night about how the, <clears throat> like, with the satisfaction theory of atonement, they're trying to, they're saying, you know, there's inherited sin and then there's actual sin, which I pretty much agree with that, you know, we have a sin nature and everyone is guilty of being a sinner because of our nature, but also because of our acts. And, you know, we have the, the acts of sin. But they say, uh, this one article that I read on the Satisfaction Theory of Thomas says that Jesus basically atoned for the inherited sin, but not for the actual sins. And then that's where the Catholics have penance, I think, to um, have forgiveness for each of their individual acts of sin or something like that, which I wouldn't totally agree with that. I think that Jesus atoned for all sins. And um, so that's something that, that I'm curious about that I've got to look into. But I don't know if necessarily if the satisfaction theory necessarily has to teach that or not. But, you know, I, I also have to look further into each and every one of the theories of atonements. But I'll end this here, and I've just got to look over these verses more, and I thank the commenter for sharing those verses, and uh, it's a lot to think about, so God bless.